Johnny Depp, Narcissist or Empath, Part 13. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor. We continue the detailed examination of Johnny Depp to establish what he is. We now turn our attention to his finances. Looking at the financial picture of an individual enables us to determine certain narcissistic indicators and potentially empathic ones also. How does the person manage their finances? Are they stable? Have they always worked, for instance? Do they ensure that they pay their bills and perhaps have savings? That would demonstrate accountability and the absence of a sense of entitlement. It would also show emotional empathy for others in terms of discharging liabilities. Of course, there are some instances where an individual has perhaps experienced unemployment or a sudden increase in their costs, the cost of living increase, which much of the world is experiencing, for instance, at the moment, through no fault of their own, that they find themselves in financial difficulty. A responsible, accountable response would be to then either increase income or, more usually, decrease outgoings. Finances do provide us with a window into the behaviour of an individual. Is the individual tight with money, even though they're particularly well off? That may well demonstrate a sense of entitlement. Is the individual somebody who regularly engages in financial largesse, buying people gifts, could be a form of bribery, paying for other people, spending outlandish amounts on individuals. All of that might be the manifestation of control, or it could just be sheer generosity, where you have an individual who is particularly well off and wants to share their good fortune. An individual who is haphazard with their finances tends to show that they have a lack of accountability. It does not necessarily mean that they're a narcissist, but it goes to the issue of accountability, which is a narcissistic indicator. Does the person borrow money and not repay? Does the person demand to be given money? That exhibits a sense of entitlement. Does the individual always discharge their obligations? That demonstrates accountability. So looking into the financial circumstances of an individual can tell us a lot. There are some narcissists who manage their finances well and use those finances for the purposes of the maintenance of a facade, demonstrating solvency and stability. There are empathic individuals who demonstrate solvency and stability and it isn't used for the purposes of facade, they just get on with it, not mentioning their finances. Narcissists invariably triangulate with money. The absence of it or the presence of it, the lack of it in terms of utilising it perhaps for a pity play to cause people to provide that residual benefit. Some narcissists, typically upper lesser, boast about how much they have or how much they earn. Sometimes it's true, often fabricated. The fact of boasting about the level of wealth that they have is invariably an indicator of poor boundary recognition and grandiosity. Is the individual one that always comes along with the begging bowl? That might denote pity plays. Does the individual have unrealistic expectations about the financial success that they might achieve? That might manifest as magical thinking. So looking at the finances of an individual tells us a lot. What about Johnny Depp? Depp described his money situation at the time in court during the 2022 defamation case against ex-wife Amber Heard. I was, at the beginning, filling out job applications at any place, video stores, clothing stores, anything, just to be able to pay the rent, Depp said, of his early financial state. Nicholas Cage had told him, I think you could be an actor. However, Depp admitted that he had no aspirations to become an actor. I was a musician, he stated, but the fact these people were going to pay me what I found to be a ludicrous sum of money, which was kind of SAG minimum, it was $1,284 a week. Joking that he'd never seen that kind of dough before in his life, Depp described his transition from music to acting as a passive experience, saying, I was placed on that road. While it appears that Depp didn't plan on acting as a career, 
he was evidently good at it, and his financial compensation, compensation did nothing but grow. The star didn't even need the gift of the gab to rake in the money. On a 2018 compilation of actors who got paid the most to say the least, according to USA Today, Depp appeared four times on a list of 15. For his portrayal of Will Castor in the 2014 film Transcendence, Depp made $10,633 per word and spoke 1,907 of them. In Edward Scissorhands, he banked $14,889 per word but only said 185 words in the entire film. For 2010's The Tourist, Depp earned $19,209 per word, speaking 1,146 words throughout. In Depp's highest ranking on this list, he made a whopping $66,606 per word for his role as the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland, with only 661 words spoken. Of course, acting is more than just saying. It is gestures, body language, facial expressions, and so forth. It's not just Depp's paper word that's been remarkable. He once made $1 million in a single week for his portrayal on The Wolf in the movie adaptation of Into the Woods. Another secret to Depp's near-constant stream of income throughout his career, this quick but huge paycheck was actually part of a strategy by production companies called Boarding, in which high-profile actors take less than their usual pay, but only have to be on set for a brief period of time. Might this approach be seen as a sense of entitlement, getting the maximum for the minimum impact, or is that just a canny operator? Johnny Depp was already an acclaimed actor by the time he hit the major leagues and landed the role of Captain Jack Sparrow in the Disney franchise Pirates of the Caribbean in 2003. The entire production was big money, and the fourth instalment, 2011's Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides, has the record for the most expensive movie ever made. At the time of this report, its budget ringing in at $422 million. With so much money put into the films, Depp's salary was obviously huge too. As Forbes wrote in 2014, it was rumoured that Depp was paid $55 million for On Stranger Tides. For 27,000's Dead Men Tell No Tales, a later publication by Forbes stated that Depp made $90 million. When the money was coming in, Depp let his decadent taste in real estate run wild. In 1995, he bought a home in Hollywood Hills for $1.8 million, which was situated on a large eucalyptus grove. By 2021, the property was valued at $19 million. A sensible investment. Depp also nabbed a Los Angeles penthouse located in the Eastern Columbia Lofts in 2002. The actor seemed to like the idea of owning apartments in the city because he ended up purchasing all five available penthouse apartments in the building. And as we know, he regularly allowed people to live there rent-free. That generosity does seem to suggest considerable emotional empathy on his part, allowing people to stay, being generous and not requiring them to pay. Of course, it could also be seen as a method of control, ensuring that he knew who was there and keeping people uh, uh, keeping people there that were around him so that he would have people in his fuel matrix on hand, ensuring that he could keep an eye on them, using financial largesse as a means of grandiose control over them. A real estate agent noted that Depp would roam from one apartment to the next like rooms in a home. He listed them all for a grand total of $12.78 million in 2016. Depp's most famous residency, however, was a small Vench village in Provence. It had previously been a ghost town, but when Depp, along with then-girlfriend Vanessa Paradis, purchased the location, he spent $10 million restoring the area. Long after their split, Depp listed the village for $55 million. He also apparently bought a private island in the Bahamas, dubbed Little Halls Pond K, in 2004 for $3.6 million after seeing it while filming the first Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Furthermore, following his engagement with Amber Heard, he dropped $16 million on an estate in Somerset, England in 2014. Such expenditures seem commensurate with the amount of money that he was earning, and, of course, real estate invariably increases in value. This does appear to be a responsible attitude to the expenditure by way of creating assets rather than liabilities, which does tend to suggest accountability on his part. 
Depp put his trust in the management group to take charge of his finances, a company that was created by Joel and Robert Mandel in 1987. After earning over $650 million throughout his acting career, Depp had surprisingly found himself in a position where he couldn't afford his monthly costs. He accused TMG of mismanaging his finances. Is this a case of profligate behaviour, which shows an absence of accountability, and then blame-shifting by laying the blame at the door of those that were managing his finances? that he's not taking accountability for his own expenditure, some of which was quite extraordinary, as we're about to see. Or is it the case that Depp was being diddled by his advisers, and therefore he demonstrates the truth of the matter? In the libel case in 2020, pressed to say how much money was allegedly taken, he replied, It was put to me this way, because I had no idea about money or amounts of money, since parents of the Caribbean 2 and 3 I had, and this is ludicrous to have to state, it's quite embarrassing. Apparently, I had made $650 million, and when I sacked them for the right reasons, I had not only lost $650 million, but I was $100 million in the hole because they, the previous business managers, had not paid the government my taxes for 17 years. Is this a pity play being doled out, or is he just stating this as a matter of fact, irrespective, still blame-shifting, or has he genuinely been badly advised and suffers as a consequence? Initially, as a consequence of the financial difficulties, Depp responded by selling some of his property. But then in 2017, as mentioned earlier, he sued his business managers at TMG for $25 million. He claimed that he had lost tens of millions of dollars and been forced to dispose of significant assets to pay for TMG's self-dealing and gross misconduct. The news of his financial woes was completely shocking to Depp, and he explained why he was so blindsided. I'm not a lawyer, he began. I'm not an accountant. I'm not qualified to help my 15-year-old son with his maths homework. I've always trusted the people around me. Is this blame-shifting blame and a failure to demonstrate accountability for his behaviour, or is it quite simply the fact that he recognises that he's not financially savvy and he placed it in the hands of others, exhibiting trust, which is demonstrated primarily in an empathic way, and therefore found himself on the receiving end of mismanagement? TMG countersued Depp for allegedly failing to pay due commissions, claiming that the actor was responsible for his own financial waste. In a statement released to E! News, the company called Depp's lawsuit a complete fabrication, adding that they did everything possible to protect Depp from his irresponsible and profligate spending over his 17 years with TMG. As I explained earlier, the case was settled, so we were never able to ascertain who was correct in what they were asserting. But the countersuit uh, and a number of alleged expenses Depp rang up over his 17 years with the management group, among them, over $75 million to acquire, improve and furnish 14 residences, including a 45-acre chateau in the south of France, a chain of islands in the Bahamas, multiple houses in Hollywood, several penthouse lofts in downtown Los Angeles, and a fully functioning house farm in Kentucky. Over $18 million to acquire and renovate a 150-foot luxury yacht. Millions acquiring and or maintaining at least 45 luxury vehicles. $30,000 per month on wine he had flown to him from around the world for his personal consumption. Over $3 million to blast from a specially made cannon the ashes of author Hunter Thompson over Aspen, Colorado. Although, Depp did say to Rolling Stone, by the way, it's not $3 million to shoot Hunter into the fucking sky, it was $5 million. Millions to acquire and maintain a massive and extremely expensive art collection, including over 200 collectible pieces and works by world-famous artists such as Warhol and Klimt, many pieces of expensive world-class jewellery, and approximately 70 collectible guitars. Over $150,000 per month on full-time security for his children. At least $300,000 a month on staff of approximately 40 full-time employees. Over $10 million in financial support to his friends, family, and certain employees. Over $4 million on a startup musical label run by a childhood friend. It would appear that if that's accurate about his spending, there does appear to be 
a lack of accountability for managing it in an appropriate way. Of course, bear in mind that he earns the money, he spends the money, he's engaged in filming, and he is an actor, not an accountant. Of course, many of you listening will say, well, I'm not an accountant either, and I manage my finances in a sensible and appropriate fashion. It's also clear, of course, that with the amount that was being spent and shelled out, that there does appear to be considerable financial generosity exhibited by Depp. Might that be as a consequence of the fact that he cares for other people, exhibiting an empathic trait, or is it simply an extension of the assertion of control by utilising his extensive and substantial finances to bribe people? With regard to Vanessa Paradis, he never got married to her, but when they broke up, Depp gave her $150 million. At the time, Depp reportedly had $300 million to his name, and since they had no marital contract, Parody would have had to pursue a settlement through court. However, to avoid that conflict, Depp simply gave her half of his fortune. The amicability of the split centred largely around their kids. As Depp explained to Roy Rolling Stone, it doesn't stop the fact that you care for that person, and they're the mother of your kids, and you'll always know each other, and you're always going to be in each other's lives because of those kids. Not going to the divorce court and fighting does demonstrate an absence of the need to assert control. Typically, most narcissists would fight because the demands or the request for money from a former spouse would, or former cohab or girlfriend would amount to a threat to control. Here, Depp did not respond in such a way. Of course, that might be demonstrative of the way that he decides that he doesn't want to go to court himself, and, if he were a narcissist, that his narcissism decides the most appropriate way to assert control in the circumstances is to do so through generosity. It can happen, but it is less likely compared to the usual response of a narcissist, which is to fight tooth and nail when it comes to the issue of money. The fact that he handed over so much, so straightforward, in a relatively prompt manner, tends to support the exhibition of some emotional empathy towards Vanessa Parody and his children. But it has to be borne in mind that certain narcissists would behave in a similar way if it suited them to do so. The finances of Johnny Depp show that there are instances of lack of accountability, both in terms of the level of spending and also in terms of generally keeping an eye on it. It also shows that he is a considerably gen uh, generous individual, and it remains to be seen when we look at the evidence in total whether this is a manifestation of facade management and the assertion of control, or whether it's born out of empathic, emotional empathy caused by the fact that he cares for other people. The financial position provides us with numerous pointers again, and in the next section we're going to address the question of the diagnosis of Depp and his ADHD, as this is particularly important. <laughs>